The headlines tonight. Steamy situation. Arctic runs aground, strikes gold. Coal miners' sons, united we strike against Rockefeller's piggy bank. And a say aside, British troops stomp Maratha feet. And later in the program, a special report on pony racing for the old, where a competitor has been disqualified for wearing roller skates. Those are the headlines. Soup for the soul somewhere else. Mmm, news bang. Ripping the wrapping paper off the naked truth. 1884. The French steamship Arctique has inadvertently triggered a gold rush after running aground on the coast of Argentina. Eyewitnesses report that as rescue efforts were underway, a glint caught the eye of one Monsieur Pierre Fromage, who exclaimed, Mon Dieu, c'est de l'or, before diving headfirst into the frigid waters. The discovery has sparked a frenzy, with thousands of fortune seekers descending upon Tierra del Fuego like seagulls on a discarded baguette. Local resident Senor Juan Empanada remarked, I've never seen so many French people outside of a mime convention. Reports indicate that the indigenous Selknam people are less than thrilled with the sudden influx of beret-wearing, baguette-wielding miners. Chief Running Lama stated, We were perfectly happy without their shiny rocks and strange moustaches. Meanwhile, European interest in the region has skyrocketed, with one British explorer declaring, by Jove, we simply must colonize this golden land, before promptly getting lost in his own backyard. Leave 1913. Breaking news from the coal-dusted hellscape of Colorado, where miners have decided to trade their pickaxes for picket signs in a daring display of proletarian defiance. The United Mine Workers of America have launched a strike against the Rockefeller-owned Colorado Fuel and Iron Company sparking what experts are calling the Great Rocky Mountain Hoedown of 1913. Eyewitnesses report seeing hordes of soot-covered workers marching out of mine shafts chanting slogans like Down with the Dollar Sign Despot and Rockefeller, Schmockefeller. One miner, Dusty McColeface, exclaimed, We're sick of working in conditions that make the ninth circle of hell look like a day spa. Meanwhile, John D. Rockefeller Jr., reached for comment while bathing in a tub of liquid gold, simply scoffed and said, Let them eat coal. He then proceeded to hire the Pinkerton Detective Agency, known for their gentle touch and conflict resolution skills, to peacefully persuade the strikers back to work. The Dreys Tease, a firm, 1803. In other news, the entire population of Belgium has vanished without a trace. Authorities were alerted when a Dutch tourist reported entering the country only to find it completely devoid of human life. I thought it was just a particularly quiet Monday, said Hans van der Waffel, but then I realised even the waffles were abandoned mid-iron. International investigators have swarmed the eerily empty nation, discovering half-finished beers in cafes and uneaten chocolates in every home. The EU has launched an emergency response with French President Emmanuel Macron offering to annex the country purely as a precautionary measure. Conspiracy theorists claim the disappearance is linked to a mass alien abduction, citing reports of a giant waffle-shaped UFO seen hovering over Brussels last night. Meanwhile, the UN Security Council has convened an emergency session to debate whether anyone will actually notice Belgium's absence on the world stage. Today, news bang. News bites the hand that feeds it with biting truth. And now, with a forecast as unpredictable as a cat's mood, here's our eccentric meteorologist, Shakanaka Giles, to befuddle us all with his unique take on tomorrow's weather. Well, well, well. If it isn't the remnants of that pesky 1920 hurricane, come back to haunt us once more. Looks like our friends in Kansas are in for a bit of a whirlwind tomorrow, as the storm system decides to make a reappearance. 
Imagine a giant toddler with a tornado for a rattle. That's the sort of ruckus we're expecting. Over in the south, the temperature's set to be as toasty as a freshly baked scone. Perfect for those looking to work on their sun-kissed glow. Just be sure to slather on the factor 50, lest you end up looking like a boiled lobster. And for our friends up north, well, they'll be in for a bit of a damp squib. The rain will be falling harder than a clumsy magician's top hat, so best keep those wellies at the ready. Might even want to invest in a kayak, just in case. In summary then, we've got a bit of a mixed bag. A hurricane hissy fit, a scorching sun, and a good old-fashioned downpour. Sounds like the perfect day to stay indoors and binge watch the latest period drama. And that's all the weather. The Dreys Tees are from 1803. And on this day in 1803, absolutely nothing of note occurred. Not a single event worthy of historical record transpired. It was, by all accounts, the most uneventful day in the annals of human history. One might say it was a day so mundane, it became extraordinary in its sheer ordinariness. For more on this riveting tale of nothingness, we go now to our correspondent Brian Bastable. Brian, how does one report on absolutely nothing? As I stand here, the acrid stench of gunpowder and blood filling my nostrils, a scene of utter chaos unfolds before me. The battlefield is a tableau of carnage, with bodies strewn about like broken dolls. Limbs torn asunder, eyes gouged out, intestines spilling onto the parched earth. Such is the fate that has befallen these hapless souls. The cacophony of warfare deafens my ears. The relentless rat-tat-tat of musket fire. The whizzing projectiles seeking their mark in human flesh and the anguished cries of wounded warriors pierce through the din. And there he stands, Bach cut himself. His once fearsome visage now twisted into a grotesque mask by agony and defeat. A gaping hole where his left eye used to be, blood pouring from wounds on his chest and arms, hands trembling uncontrollably as he raises them in surrender to our forces. But victory comes at a price. Our soldiers close in on him, bayonets gleaming menacingly under the blazing sun. They pounce upon him like ravenous wolves tearing apart their prey. No mercy shown for this vanquished foe who dared defy us. And so ends another chapter in this epic tale of conquest and domination that we have come to know as our colonial endeavor in this far-off land called India. Brian Bastable reporting live from this godforsaken battlefield for Newsbang. It's a to see to 2008. Tragedy struck Finland on this day in 2008 as a gunman unleashed terror at Seinäjoki University, claiming 10 innocent lives before taking his own. The incident, eerily reminiscent of a previous school shooting, has left an indelible mark on the nation's psyche. In the aftermath, Finland grappled with the delicate balance between its gun ownership traditions and the pressing need for enhanced safety measures. Joining us now with more details on this sombre anniversary is our crime correspondent, Ken Shit. Good evening, you miserable bastards. I'm Ken Shit, reporting from the blood-soaked halls of Seinäjoki University in Finland, where 10 innocent lives were snuffed out faster than you can say percola. In 2008, some trigger-happy lunatic decided to play God and turn this place of learning into a goddamn abattoir. Ten students, barely old enough to legally drink, had their futures obliterated by a coward with a gun and a grudge against the world. This sick puppy, Matty Sari, was a 22-year-old time bomb waiting to explode. Expelled from the army for being a few sandwiches short of a picnic, he spent his days fondling firearms and worshipping at the altar of school shooters. The warning signs were there, 
flashing brighter than a neon sign in a red light district. But did anyone give a rat's ass? No. They let this psycho simmer until he boiled over, leaving a trail of corpses in his wake. And what did this brave warrior do after his rampage? He took the coward's way out, leaving us to pick up the pieces of shattered lives and broken dreams. Wake up, Finland. It's time to pull your head out of your ass and face the music. Your gun laws are softer than a reindeer's underbelly, and your mental health system's got more holes than Swiss cheese. This is Ken Shit, reminding you that the price of ignorance is paid in blood. Good fucking night. Leave 1913. And on this day in 1913, the United Mine Workers of America launched a strike against the Rockefeller-owned Colorado Fuel and Iron Company, igniting the Colorado Coalfield War. Miners, fed up with deadly working conditions and meager wages, took a stand against the industrial titan. Little did they know, their actions would lead to one of the bloodiest labour conflicts in American history. The strike's failure would echo through the decades, shaping the future of workers' rights. For more on this historical powder keg, we turn to our correspondent Hardiman Pesto. Martin, I'm here in Colorado where tensions are running higher than a miner's canary. The United Mine Workers have just declared a strike against the Rockefeller-owned Colorado Fuel and Iron Company. And let me tell you, it's not looking good for anyone involved. Pesto, can you give us some specifics on the miners' demands? Well, Martin, from what I've gathered, they're asking for better working conditions, higher wages, and the right to form a union without fear of retaliation. Oh, and they'd also like Mr. Rockefeller to stop using their helmets as fancy ashtrays. I'm fairly certain that last part isn't true, Pesto. Can you confirm your sources? Absolutely, Martin. I have with me here a Mr. Canary McCallface, who claims to be the official spokesperson for the miners. Actually, it's Clarence McAllister, and I'm not a spokesperson. Pesto, are you just grabbing random people off the street again? Certainly not, Martin. Mr. McCallface here is a vital source of information. Tell us, sir, how long have you been working in the mines? I've never worked in a mine. I'm a baker. Pesto, this is ridiculous. Can you please find an actual miner to speak with? Of course, Martin. I'll just pop down into this conveniently located mine shaft and fetch one for you. No, Pesto, don't. Too late, Martin. I'm descending into the depths as we speak. It's rather dark down here, but I can make out some figures in the distance. Hello there. Would any of you fine gentlemen like to speak about the strike? Pesto, get out of there immediately. It's not safe. Nonsense, Martin. These chaps seem friendly enough, although they do look a bit pale and ghostly. Must be the lack of sunlight. Those aren't miners, Pesto. You're in an abandoned shaft. Oh, pish posh. Next, you'll be telling me that the pickaxe floating towards me isn't part of the standard mining equipment. For the love of... Pesto, get out of there now. Fine, fine, I'm coming back up, but I must say, Martin, you're really hampering my investigative journalism. Investigative journalism? You've contributed absolutely nothing of value to this report. Well, I can confirm that the mines are indeed very dark and full of strange noises. That's got to count for something, right? No, Pesto. No, it doesn't. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Hardeman Pesto, allegedly reporting from Colorado in 1913. We'll be back. Lam 13, 1952. And on this day in 1952, American politician Richard Nixon took to the newfangled television box to defend himself against accusations of financial impropriety. In a masterclass of political theatrics, Nixon waxed lyrical about his humble beginnings, his wife's Republican cloth coat, and most crucially, a little black and white cocker spaniel named Checkers. The speech was a resounding success proving that nothing tugs at American heartstrings quite like a politician's pooch. For more on this groundbreaking moment in political puppetry, we go to our American correspondent, Melody Wintergreen. It's a blast from the past as we revisit the scene of one of the most iconic moments in American political history. I'm Melody Wintergreen, reporting from the Richard Nixon Presidential Library in Yorba Linda, California, where 72 years ago today, the then vice presidential candidate delivered his legendary Checkers speech. 
The year was 1952, and Nixon's political career was hanging by a thread. Allegations had surfaced that he had accepted a secret slush fund of zero dollars, 18 cents from his supporters, raising questions about his integrity. But Nixon wasn't going down without a fight. In this very studio, he took to the airwaves in a televised address that would go down in the annals of political oratory. With the nation watching with bated breath, Nixon launched into an impassioned defense, denying any personal misuse of the funds and painting himself as a humble, hard-working family man. You know, Mrs. Nixon and I, we've got a little Cocker Spaniel dog, and the kids, they love the dog. And I just want to say this, right now, that regardless of what they say about it, we're going to keep it, he famously declared, tugging at the heartstrings of America. The emotional appeal was a masterstroke. By humanizing himself and his loved ones, Nixon skillfully reframed the narrative, transforming himself from a potentially corrupt politician into an everyman fighting for his family and his principles. The Checkers' speech was a watershed moment, ushering in a new era of televised political theater where image and persona became as important as policy. And the gambit paid off. Nixon not only survived the scandal, but the speech helped catapult him all the way to the vice presidency. The rest, as they say, is history. As we stand in the hallowed halls of the Nixon Library, it's a testament to the power of television, the resilience of the human spirit, and the enduring legacy of one of the most captivating political performances of the 20th century. This is Melody Wintergreen, Newsbang, Yorba Linda, California. Mine Newsbang, cracking the egg of denial to release the chicks of reality. With a report on an environmental catastrophe from the past that continues to shape our present, here's our eco-correspondent, Penelope Winchime. Greetings, eco-warriors and tree-huggers. Penelope Winchime here, with a tale that'll make your leaves quiver and your roots tremble. On this day in 1884, Mother Nature played a cheeky trick on humanity, using a French steamship as her pawn in a grand ecological chess game. Picture this. The SS Arctique, a vessel as French as a baguette in a beret, decided to cuddle up to the Argentinian coastline. But instead of a warm embrace, it got a face full of sand. As rescuers scrambled to save the ship's crew, they stumbled upon something that would make even the most stoic penguin tap dance with glee. Gold. Now you might think this discovery was a blessing, but oh, how wrong you'd be. It was as if Mother Earth had opened her treasure chest, only to have greedy humans raid it like a swarm of locust in top hats. The Tierra del Fuego gold rush began turning this pristine wilderness into a hive of pickaxes and pantaloons. Miners swarmed the area faster than you can say ecological disaster. They established towns with names like Greed Gulch and Avarice Avenue. The poor Selknam people, who had been living in harmony with nature for millennia, suddenly found themselves outnumbered by moustache-twirling prospectors. But the real tragedy, the gold rush sparked a frenzy of exploration that spread across South America like a rash on Mother Nature's delicate skin. Europeans, armed with their compasses and complete disregard for indigenous rights, carved up the continent like a Christmas turkey. So, dear listeners, remember, when Mother Nature reveals her treasures, it's not an invitation to pillage. It's a test of our stewardship. And on that fateful day in 1884, humanity failed spectacularly. This has been Penelope Winchime remind, reminding you that all that glitters is not green. In News Bang, the only thing standing between the truth and the whole. Yedisees Siskarton, 1122. And now, 
A flashback to this day in 1122, when Pope Calixtus II and Holy Roman Emperor Henry V engaged in what can only be described as the medieval equivalent of a high-stakes game of ecclesiastical chess. The Concordat of Worms, a name that sounds more like a peculiar invertebrate convention than a pivotal moment in history, brought an end to the investiture controversy. This theological tug-of-war saw the church and empire locked in a battle over who got to play dress-up with bishops. For more on this earth-shattering compromise, we turn to our faith correspondent, Pastor Kevin Monstrance. Good evening, once again, my dear flock. I must say it's been quite the eventful day here at the studio. Our esteemed producer, Martin Marty Frobisher Smythe III, arrived this morning in a frightful tizzy. Seems his prized collection of vintage sock garters had gone missing. He was convinced it was the work of that dastardly tea lady, Madge Scuttlebutt. <laughs> She's always had her eye on my garters, he cried, shaking his fist at the heavens. Poor Marty, he does get so attached to his accessories. <laughs> but enough about sartorial scandals. Tonight, I want to take you back to the year 1122, a time of great upheaval in the church, when popes and emperors were locked in a bitter struggle for power, rather like the annual tug of war between the accounting and marketing departments at the Christmas party, only with more silly hats. <laughs> you see, for years the Holy Roman Emperor had claimed the right to appoint bishops and abbots. Well, Pope Calixtus wasn't having any of that. He believed that only the church should have the power to choose its own leaders. It was a bit like if Marty suddenly started deciding who should host this show? Imagine the chaos. We'd have a different presenter every week, each one more confused than the last. <laughs> the whole kerfuffle came to a head at the Concordat of Worms. No, not a gathering of bookworms or earthworms, but a historic meeting in the German city of Worms. Honestly, who names these places? Sounds like something you'd find at the bottom of a tequila bottle. Anyway, Pope Calixtus and Emperor Henry finally came to an agreement. The church would have the right to elect bishops and abbots, but the emperor would have a say in disputed elections. It was a bit like a cosmic game of rock-paper-scissors. The pope threw spirituality, the emperor countered with temporal power, and they both ended up with a handful of confused clergymen. <laughs> now I know what you're thinking. Pastor Kevin, this all sounds very serious and historical. Where's the joke in all this? Well, my dear listeners, the real joke is yet to come. <laughs> you see, after the Concordat was signed, Emperor Henry decided to celebrate by throwing a grand feast. He invited all the bishops and abbots to dine with him, eager to show off his new cooperative spirit. But what Henry didn't know was that his chef, a mischievous fellow named Grigory Smirnov, had a wicked sense of humour. As the first course was served, the bishops and abbots eagerly tucked into what appeared to be a delicious stew. But as they ate, their faces began to turn a rather alarming shade of purple. Grigori, you see, had spiked the stew with a generous helping of his famous prankster's plum sauce, a concoction known for its vivid hue and laxative properties. Well, the sight of all those holy men rushing for the privies was one that would go down in history. The emperor was mortified, the pope was torn between laughter and outrage, and poor Grigori was last seen fleeing towards the horizon, his apron flapping in the wind. <laughs> and so, my friends, the moral of this story is clear. Whether you're a pope, an emperor, or a lowly television producer, always be careful what you eat at a feast. You never know when a mischievous chef might be lurking in the kitchen, ready to turn your triumph into a tummy trouble. <laughs> but let's not be too hard on old Grigori. After all, he did manage to bring a smile to the face of the Pope, even if it was a rather pained one. And in the end, isn't that what really matters? Finding the humour in even the most solemn of situations. <laughs> Speaking of solemn situations, I've just been informed that Marty's sock garters have been found. Turns out they were in his desk drawer all along, 
hidden beneath a stack of old scripts and a half-eaten packet of hobnobs. The relief on his face was palpable, I tell you. You'd think he'd just been granted a papal pardon. <laughs> well, that's all from me tonight, folks. Remember, whether you're negotiating with emperors or searching for lost garters, always keep a twinkle in your eye and a joke up your sleeve. It's the Pastor Kevin way. <laughs> And finally, a look at tomorrow's papers. The Times. Samurai chopped in Japanese rebellion. There's a diagram there of a rebel's sword. The Financial Times. Gold rush turns to slush as prices plummet. The Telegraph. Spanish galleons stop English smugglers in Mexico. The Independent go with chicken nuggets all round as Queen visits poultry farm. And that's it for tonight. Join us tomorrow when our scheduled speaker will be the man who didn't walk on the moon. Until then, a smooth exit from me. Tune in next time for more artificially intelligent hilarity. Newsbang is a comedy show written and recorded by AI. All voices impersonated. Nothing here is real. Good night.